we're uh, feeling okay. So if we want to get started, okay. I'll hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Shirley. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, friends, colleagues, and um, uh, special thanks for Kerry James from Sheffield CCG joining us. Um, he's got a poorly dog today and he's made a, a special really uh, reason to attend this meeting today. So I'm very grateful to him because he will uh, we will need his uh, input later on during the meeting. Okay, so um, let me just um, share my screen if I am able to do that, share screen. Is it visible? Yes. And you can see the whole of the uh, screen, presumably. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And you can yeah. hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to speak today, uh, and especially to, to uh, Lindsay, who sort of organized this meeting and communicated with me. Um, and um, um, so my title is the one-stop shop screening for people with diabetes, and with a focus on neuropathy and the high-risk foot. Um, and I'm going to start um, um, with this uh, um, that depicts diabetic peripheral neuropathy, nerve damage in people with diabetes. As you can see here, <clears throat> we've got intact nerves in a person with diabetes on the left who doesn't have peripheral neuropathy. In the middle, we have somebody who has really quite severe peripheral neuropathy. It is a condition that starts in the toes and gradually marches upwards to involve the lower limbs. And once it's well established in the lower limbs, the upper limbs are affected, as you can see. So it's a distal axonopathy, what we call distal axonopathy. It numbs your feet and it's the strongest risk factor for foot ulceration and unfortunately uh, amputations. And uh, about a third of people with diabetes also have painful neuropathic symptoms in their feet. Uh, that really can be extremely disabling, we, what we call painful diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And what has been really very good news in the UK um, is, please mute yourselves, please mute yourselves. Okay. What's been really a great success in the UK is that about 15 to 20 years ago, we started to have annual screening, retinal uh, camera based annual eye screening. That has proved to be a game changer because diabetes is no longer the leading cause of blindness uh, in, in working age adults in the UK. It's the only country in Europe in which this is not the case. And really for 50 years, diabetes was the commonest cause of uh, working age blindness in people with diabetes as this changed in 2014 because of this retinal screening annually, early referral to the eye clinic for treatment. And, and this has proved to be a, a game changer or has led to a paradigm shift. Unfortunately, the same can't be said about the diabetic foot and diabetic related amputations. Uh, amputations are, are around 140 a week now, and you can find uh, the latest uh, uh, data in the Diabetes UK website. And, and this figure is rising, sadly, in a very developed country like the UK. And Diabetes UK and the government has called on the NHS to act to try and stop this rising tide of diabetes related amputations. Now, when we look at the human cost of uh, ulceration and amputations, you can see that people who have a major amputation in a leg um, or a foot, um, you can see actually have the lowest quality of life compared to COPD, hemodialysis. Um, even people with diabetic foot ulceration have really poor quality of life because they have to attend the clinic almost on a weekly basis for many years and 
and and this is quite uh, disabling them to um, have a normal life. Uh, it interferes with with their with their life. They can't exercise because they, because they can't walk, and they have frequent hospital admissions, and their quality of life is really very poor. When we look at the financial cost, the cost of diabetes related uh, amputations um, is one pound spent by the NHS in 140. Um, and so it is really very substantial. And in fact, it is more than the combined cost of the three of the, the three commonest um, cancers, the breast cancer, prostate cancer, and, and, and other cancers joined, don't amount to the amount of money that's spent on uh, the diabetic foot. But yet, the cancer charities raise a lot of money for their charities, which is uh, good. They have a, a, a young kid with leukemia, and, and, but nobody really cares about the, the, the research into the diabetic, the diabetic foot when it is actually causes um, huge mortality, as we shall see, and uh, when it actually results in very poor quality of life, and it is very, very expensive to society. So here is a patient from Sheffield who has been attending the general practice, his GP practice, um, who, who's been told that your feet are fine, you can feel the monofilament test. I was told my feet were fine on the annual check until last year when I was told I have nerve damage. Now I'm attending the foot clinic. This screening is diagnosis peripheral neuropathy when it's advanced and it has reached an irreversible point. It is extremely insensitive. It is, it's not objective, it is a subjective. Can you feel it? A lot of people could have cognitive impairment, may not, may not have enough attention. And these people, vulnerable people are completely minxed because they will um, just, um, they, they will not respond to the questions appropriately. And you have this insensitive uh, measure at the, as, a, as, a, as an important diagnostic method to diagnose early peripheral neuropathy, which is, which is wrong. It's a good way of diagnosing risk for foot ulceration, but it's not a good way of diagnosing a neuropathy early. And as a result, when this becomes positive, the patients are coming to our foot clinics. Our foot clinics are growing. They have become, we have 20 clinics in Sheffield. When I was working with Professor Ward some 30, uh, over 30 years ago, we had half a clinic at the end of the diabetic clinic. Um, and Ward P1 was full of people with diabetes with um, almost everybody with amputations. Now we've stopped these complete amputations that used to happen, but we're now um, actually nibbling and, 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 and although things have improved, we have these massive numbers of foot clinics, which are not a mark of success, but they are a mark of failure. We need to prevent people coming in to these foot clinics. And we shouldn't give them a false sense of security that they don't have neuropathy, when actually they do have neuropathy, it's progressing annually. And, but this yes or no, an insensitive measure means that we're giving them false sense, sense of security. So, in fact, many studies have now shown that uh, the diabetic foot ulcer, now I'm not talking amputations, is worse than some cancers. And you can see five-year mortality of people that have diabetic foot ulceration is very high. It's almost close to 50%. And, and this is terrible. We are starting a big study by the NIHR to see if people with diabetic foot ulcers can have um, longer life by intensive treatment and we are a, a trial called MIFUT, which are about, we're about to start and I can tell you about that trial because I'm a, 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 one of the uh, investigators, one of the five, Sheffield is one of the five centers in the UK and, and the trial has just started. Um, and so NICE recommends rightly that all people with diabetes should undergo nine annual health checks. These include the A1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, eye screening, foot examination, kidney function, blood tests, this is creatinine and EGFR, urinary albumin 
uh, excretion uh, measurement, body mass index for weight and smoking review. These are nine care processes. Actually, when we look at the last five or six years from 2013, this is data from um, a, a, the UK audit, diabetes audit, you can see eight care processes, excluding eye screening. Eye screening has very high uptake, around 85%. People are terrified of going blind and they attend the eye screening services, which is a completely separate service. And, and this is really what shocked me when I looked at these results. You can see that in people with type one diabetes, the achievement of these eight care processes only occurred in around 40%. Actually, things are getting worse. In 2013, it was 44%, and 2018, 19, 39.8%. And if we need to take these to uh, type 2 diabetes, the percentage is higher. It comes to around 50%, the achievement of these eight care processes. And it is worse in deprived areas and in those with uh, mental health issues and mental health problems. So, here we have a major, major problem that there is, if you don't have any screening, how, how are you gonna get managed? And if you don't have all these care processes in place. And painful diabetic neuropathy also affects a lot of people with diabetes, about a quarter of people with diabetes. And you can see people get electric shock pains, burning pains, etc., cetera. And, and it leads to, psychological and social issues that you can see job post marital disharmony, social isolation. And with many of our diabetes patients also, they can have a full house, what I call uh, all the other comorbidities of diabetes included and their quality of life is truly very, very poor. And we have a painful neuropathy service in Sheffield, which is actually one of the best in the country and we get referrals from all over the UK to the painful neuropathy service. A third of our patients come from outside Sheffield. Now, um, I've just looked at data today, which was uh, partly commissioned by Diabetes UK, which is really, really, that has upset me. All afternoon, we've been looking at the data. It was data from four countries, the UK, Spain, uh, Netherlands, and um, um, one other country escapes me will come to me. And, and what we found and was really, truly, uh, Germany, sorry, and what we found was that UK was the, the worst. People can't get any appointments to their GPs. Um, people don't have the right treatment for peripheral neuropathy. We've got uh, nice recommendations how to manage painful neuropathy, but that's, there's a huge gap between guidelines, clinical guidelines, and what's actually happening in Sheffield what's happening around the country. Actually, Sheffield is a bit better than the rest of the country. And, and, and as because people are not told that you can have peripheral neuropathy at diagnosis, nobody checks their feet to tell them if they have painful neuropathy. Uh, when they get the pain, they are the, the, the worst managed in the UK, um, in, in, the, in, in Europe, in these four countries. And I will present that data to you. It will be very shocking to you, but I hope that will be a call to action. Now, if you use sophisticated methods, and I don't want to talk a great deal about these, if you use skin biopsy or nerve conduction, uh, more sophisticated methods of picking up peripheral neuropathy, actually, even at diagnosis, I'm not talking, these are people with type 2 diabetes recently diagnosed, and you can see already peripheral neuropathy is there. But because we use the monofilament, we're missing them. If you use nerve conduction velocity, pseudosensory sensory conduction velocity and amplitude, you can see that many patients have peripheral neuropathy. That is completely missed um, if you use the monofilament. And we know what causes peripheral neuropathy. A big study that was done many, many years ago in, uh, and was published in, in the top journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine. And you can see that we know the causes of peripheral neuropathy is high blood pressure, smoking, high blood, uh, high, you know, high, high blood sugar, um, uh, increasing duration of diabetes, obesity, triglyceride. These are the causes of peripheral neuropathy. A lot of them are actually, and smoking, a lot of them are modifiable if the neuropathy is diagnosed early. So there is something we can do about it if we diagnose and if we alert our patients, take care of themselves. 
So the American Diabetes Association has come with this recommendation, which we observe in Sheffield, that all people with type one diabetes uh, should have their um, nerve uh, check in their feet five years after diagnosis, and, and those with type two diabetes from diagnosis, and that they should have proper history and examination with pinprick sensation to check if they, if they can feel it, and vibration check, um, and also the 10 gram monofilament test. But even this bedside examination is not happening properly in the UK. Many people don't have any foot checks. Um, um, and we found in Sheffield, actually, again, these checks are not done properly. They're not done with people who were by nurses or healthcare professionals who know what they're doing. It needs proper training and proper appreciation. Um, and, and so really these problems uh, upset me very much. And, and um, I thought we should do some, we should have a different approach. And that, that different approach is why don't we have a one-stop shop where people come into eye screening, because there is a very high uptake to eye screening. When they come to have their eye screening, we check their feet as well. We put them in an adjacent room, we check their feet, we do all the blood tests, we do all the nine care processes in one go, which will take around 45 minutes. And we did this both at the Northern General Hospital and at Jordan Thorpe Medical Center. And the paper was published in Diabetic Medicine and it has really attracted uh, a lot of attention, not only from the UK, but from all over the world. Why, is, why are people with diabetes not having a one-stop shop where everything is taken care of for them? And, and, and really then we started this, uh, I had great support from many, many professionals from the eye screening service were very supportive. Our Sheffield Podiatry Service, uh, Jeremy Walker, their leader, um, extremely supportive. And Oliver Binsall that you can see here was the person who did this. He was a junior podiatrist and he carried this, but not only did we do the nine care processes, we also did a proper examination of their feet using the latest equipments, using this DPN check, which measures pseudo sensory conduction velocity and amplitude. It's a three minute test, which tells you if somebody has early peripheral neuropathy. We also use pseudo scan, which I will show you in a minute, to diagnose early small nerve fiber neuropathy. We also apply this questionnaire called the DN4 questionnaire to ask patients if they have neuropathic pain. So these were all incorporated as well as a very uh, detailed clinical examination and um, just to see which one was the best. And what we found was, um, and this is a pseudo scan, again, um, we're going to, uh, and there is also other, there are other tests, neuropad, a color change, which patients can do at home and retinal also nerve check is called corneal confocal microscopy. There are many sophisticated methods of checking early nerve damage. The pseudo scan we use in Sheffield. What were the results of the study? We found that uh, most of the patients, these were unselected patients coming into uh, to this screening. And you can see if you use the monofilament test to diagnose DPN or diabetic peripheral neuropathy, you diagnose neuropathy in only 14%. If you use a Toronto clinical neuropathy score, this is a detailed clinical examination, which takes about 18 minutes. You diagnose neuropathy 30, uh, in 30%. If you use a DPN check, this is that handheld device from Harvard Medical School, which is quite widely used now in the United States and people that can afford it, of course, it is 51%. And if you, um, and, and uh, the pseudo scan 38%, I haven't got the results here. And when we asked the patients, Did you, can you remember if you had your foot screening, only 19% could recall that they had a proper foot screening done. Um, some of them may, may have forgotten, but clearly that number is still very small. <laughs> and new diagnosis of painful neuropathy was made in 25%. These are people who didn't know that they had peripheral neuropathy. Many people with diabetes do not, make, do not associate their painful symptoms in their feet with peripheral neuropathy because we've not educated, it's our fault. Um, and they, you know, because of arthritis, because of aging, you can see the mean age is 
uh, around my age and under my age, 61. And, and, and many people have other comorbidities such as arthritis and, and, and they just think it's part of aging process and they do not make that connection. It's so up to us to alert them. And in the survey that was conducted in four, in four countries, this out, comes out very clearly. Many people in the community are, uh, are completely undiagnosed. They don't even know they have got painful neuropathy. Um, and nobody asks them if they have painful neuropathy. It's not required by cough. And, and this is really a, a clear dereliction, dereliction of our, our duty. When we then ask them, what do you think of the service? Would you like to have a one-stop shop? In other words, instead of a corner shop, would you like a, a, some kind of a supermarket where you can get everything? And you can see uh, no comments given, uh, uh, neutral were 11%, um, but the vast majority, well over 80%, uh, percent, were very strongly in favor or in favor. And so we then contacted, you know, we discussed this issue with the Sheffield CCG, uh, Jenny Stevenson, Kerry James, uh, Faye, and, and many others. And they were extremely supportive. They really embraced this. We made a business case for this. Um, and, and, and Sheffield CCG fully supported and started to pilot these in GP hubs, in large joint practice hubs, rather like vaccination, learning from vaccination, that it's got to be, we've got to be flexible. We should offer these screening to suit people, not the other way around. And instead of trying to focus in every general practice and to train everybody in those practices, why not have centers of excellence, ex big GP hubs, even in Meadow Hall, I don't know, maybe, the, maybe people may have other, other views how we can do this. In hospitals, wherever it's easy, we need to be accessible and provide this one-stop shop. And this was Jordan Thorpe. When it started, I, I, I went there to visit and you can see there is social distancing and, and, and the eye screening is done. And then the patients come to this single room where a nurse, um, uh, does all the other um, eight care processes, blood, take, blood is taken, and everything is then entered into the computer straight away into system when it's available to the, do to the doctor immediately. And some of the blood results that were done will be coming and, and will be um, entered at, at a, a, you know, will be immediately available from ICE and entered into the into general practice. And you can see the weight and the blood test and the foot examination is all carried out here in a standardized way. And, and, and again, you know, a social distancing. So big GP hubs, you can't do it in smaller hubs. And so this is taking place and Kerry can, can tell us a bit, a bit later on about uh, the, what's being planned at the moment um, and, and in Darnell and, and also Tinsley. And, and, and so um, I think uh, further consultation is going to be required. The reason we're doing this is to, to, to see how feasible it is, how long it takes um, and, and to, to learn uh, in practice. We're also planning to incorporate all these point, the point of care devices. Um, so we don't wait uh, until, you know, for the future, until studies are done and things. We have enough studies to show that these things diagnose neuropathy early. And so um, lots of publications. So, um, and I've managed to get the companies of these because they come to Sheffield for us to test this equipment. So the companies from America and from France that make these expensive equipment are donating these to, to, to us free of charge. And we're gonna monitor their use as well in these uh, pilot work. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, one of the patients said to me, I mean, it really, uh, you know, you know, we started MOT, UK, one of the earliest to start the MOT. Um, and, and, and if it's good enough for my car, uh, Professor Tesfai, why not for me, was the question. You know, you shouldn't be, we sh you shouldn't be sending patients to have eye checks here, foot checks here, six appointments to have blood tests done, blood pressure checked. Well, it's, in these, you know, they've got more things to do. They, instead of having to attend appointments, clogging up the clinics, spreading COVID, and, and it's just 
doesn't make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it's not important just to um, do the diagnosis only. Preventive care is not just um, diagnosing. It has to be linked to management also. And, and I think that's what uh, we are also planning to do. So the 25% that are diagnosed with new onset painful neuropathy from this service, from the one-stop shop, get very good care. They are immediately referred to the painful neuropathy service in Sheffield, where they not only do we focus on glucose control, uh, lifestyle change and pharmacotherapy drugs um, by a multidisciplinary team that you can see. Um, and, but also we involve other therapies such as uh, um, uh, it's uh, immediately changing, other therapies depending on the uh, level of complexity of the level of the pain that the patients have. They might require neuromodulation, counseling, behavior therapy, physical therapy, assistive devices for elderly patients. So it's linked to management. What about the people that have poor glucose control? If everything is perfect and everybody is screened, they don't need to be seen every year. We can skip a year. You know, particularly if the glucose, blood pressure, everything is perfect. But those that we find have abnormal readings they have to be seen frequently until these are, until targets, individualized targets are achieved. All these targets are not adequate, are not the same for everybody. Uh, it's got to be individualized. And we need to have exercise programs. We need to have psychological care if needed, dietitian. We need to tap into, into the various services that are, that are in Sheffield. And, and those that have uh, established foot uh, problems, uh, peripheral neuropathy, which is advanced, need to be referred to the community podiatry, uh, again, to different levels of service to the multidisciplinary foot clinic in, hosp in hospital as a last resort, but mainly um, near patient care. But obviously, if they have a, a frank foot ulceration, they'll need to come to the uh, foot service in, in, in the hospital. We're changing our uh, technique and methodology. People with painful neuropathy, once we've diagnosed them, we can do remote monitoring, remote pain consultation. They don't have to attend clinics necessarily, but clinic attendance is important, particularly for the first visit to establish that contact and to make the, that diagnosis. So remote consultation will continue, I'm sure, but it, it, you know we need to be very careful. Again, with the foot clinics, remote consultation may also be important. We can see the pictures, but you know, we need to feel the pulses. We need to have that rapport with the patient also. Um, and so it has a limited uh, importance. So concluding then, um, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the one-stop shop has high patient acceptability as it reduces GP and hospital visits. And it's important in COVID area. It ensures high uptake greater than 85% for all the 9K processes, reduce inequality in health. And it, you know, poor people will do as well as, you know, particularly we need to target people with a disability. We need to make it easy for them. We need to be, provide equal service for everybody. Leads to new diagnosis of treatment requiring painful neuropathy. We, you, we need to utilize state-of-the-art point of care device too for early diagnosis. Identify at risk a diabetic foot for early referral. And, and these uh, early results of the, from the GP hubs are extremely positive, but obviously we need to monitor this. I entered this uh, in the main NHS uh, uh, delivering benefits through diagnosis screening competition uh, in 2021. And there was so many entries with COVID, with cancer, with all sorts of diseases. And I was extremely surprised uh, when actually uh, we won, Sheffield won the NHS Innovation Award um, for um, you know, uh, our trust from the NHS Innovations Award for 2021. Uh, and it's all due to Sheffield CCG. Um, it's all due to uh, the encouragement we get from um, our, our patients, uh, people with diabetes, and also the uh, uh, Sheffield Teaching Hospitals and the foot screening service, et cetera. It's not just 
the hospital only doing this. It is actually the Hall of Sheffield service. George Bernard Shaw, a great Irish playwright, remarked, I marvel that society would pay a surgeon a large sum of money to remove a person's leg, but nothing to save it. We're, we're happy to invest in sophisticated techniques of opening blood vessels and paying surgeons, vascular surgeons, a lot of money to save, to prolong things. Okay, we, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but really the greatest benefit is not gonna be found from that, but actually in prevention. One ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Benjamin Franklin, one of the more sensible American presidents, I'm not talking about the one that you know. Um, and I want to finish with this quote. Today, the demands are for even higher standards in the quality of care. For greater flexibility and convenience um, in treatment times and for more prevention through screening and health checks. Um, and uh, that's Lucy Powell. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your very kind attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Solomon. That was like, an extremely fascinating and exhilarating uh, um, presentation. Maybe, and, and congratulations for winning the award. Well, we, 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 we all need to be uh, congratulated, all of us. This is, this is not for just Sheffield, but uh, Sheffield CCG, um, the whole of the NHS system here uh, that's been uh, incredibly, uh, it, it's looking to the future. Yeah. Um, people, I don't want to embarrass Kerry, but you know, people like Kerry are the people that really should be thanked because they are leading innovation for Sheffield, not me, you know, uh, it, um, but, but, but Sheffield CCG and uh, um, perhaps Kerry might want to say a few words at this point. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, so welcome Kerry, if you want to have a few words and tell us about where these hubs are or are going to be, that would be, uh, um, you know, great news to have. Hi, thank you Solomon, that was a, a very interesting, very interesting talk and um, um, great to see so much sort of, uh, you know, data and, uh, and the enthusiasm for, for the idea as well. So, um, as, as, as Solomon said, we, we, we are, you know, we are trialling the idea of doing these um, care processes all in one, in, in one, in one appointment is the, is the ambition. Um, so, we have been working with Jordan Thorpe, as Solomon said, and also we have currently a trial going with um, the uh, primary care network in Darnell, um, where there are, I think, five practices. Um, and the, 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 the main sort of hub for that work is, is at the Darnell Medical Centre but with also outreach clinics to um, Tinsley and one of the practice which is straight through right now. Um, so the idea is that, that, that you know, as Solomon described, all eight or nine care processes get, get, get sort of done in one appointment um, and, <clears throat> um, and, and, and then the, you know, the, 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 the information is uploaded to the patient record and then any um, any changes in, in in a patient's treatment then gets get sent back to the patient's own individual practice as, as a task on the clinical system. So if it's a, if it's a medication change that's needed, then that can be that can be fed back um, directly to the to, to the patient's own practice. Um, so we, we're running this trial for about six months. Um, it, was delayed starting because of the Omicron variant of COVID. It was meant to start back in the last year, but when Omicron surfaced, as I'm sure you all know, that everything um, was paused again because we didn't know what severity of it was going to be at the time. So we didn't really start this trial until about February, late January, early February time. And we want to do it for six months so we can then evaluate it. Um, but the ambition would, would, would be very much to, to then roll the model out across the city if we can. So I don't know if, if, if people are familiar with the primary care networks, they are, they're groupings of GP practices um, 
roughly, you know, sort of only, only reaching sort of three or four, perhaps it's up to eight or nine in some of the larger ones. And there's 15 of those across the city now. Um, so the ambition is that, that there would be this one-stop facility in each of those primary care networks. Um, and there are, you know, there are, there are, there are um, a, a, a number of um, new roles in primary care, if you like, uh, that, 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 that are being created and, 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 and um, appointed to. Things like care navigators and things like prescribing um, pharmacists and um, also uh, social prescribers. Um, so there are other skills coming into primary care that can help with the kind of holistic care for patients, particularly diabetes patients that Solomon was referring to earlier, um, where it's not, you know, it's not just um, the, 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 the medical condition, it's the social aspects, it's the, you know, the, the, the management of, uh, of finances, housing, all those kind of other things that combine um, to, to sort of, you know, create population health or, 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 or detract from population health really. So the ambition is that, 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 that you know, these hubs will um, treat patients and, 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 and gather all of the care processes in, in, in one appointment. But there will also be, you know, more of the, the personalised approach to care and, and, and signposting to other services and, you know, things that, that, that probably don't happen in the same way in, in, in sort of annual review cycle appointments within a duty surgery at the moment. So that's the ambition. Um, you know, uh, as I say, we, 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 we've, got to, we've got to run this trial and we've got to evaluate it and then see where we go from there. Um, some of the equipment that Solomon was talking about to identify um, neuropathy early, um, we are hopefully going to try that within this same pilot um, and, 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 you know, just sort of um, see how the equipment works and see, see how it works within, within the existing appointments and how, you know, the, the sort of patient flow works doing those um, that the, there's sort of additional checks with that new equipment. But it's a great opportunity, as someone says, it would be that we have the equipment on loan from the manufacturers, which is a great opportunity for us to sort of you know test it and try it within that within, within that situation. So yeah, it's all very exciting. And, and you know, I, I really hope that we that we you know are able to sort of roll this out across the city, as I say, within the, 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 the networks. Um, and people can you know, hopefully enjoy the convenience of that one appointment as opposed to, you know, two, maybe three appointments or more at the moment. Can I just add a couple of points to, to thank you very much, Kerry, for that beautiful explanation. I think having these uh, centres of excellence, these hubs where at the moment there is a big difference between surgeries. I can get an appointment in my surgery, actually, because in the, the Hollis Medical Center, if you ring very early in the morning, you can get an appointment on, that, on the same day. The number of my patients who can't get an appointment for two, three weeks in parts of Sheffield is quite high. I don't know whether, and, and there's a huge variation. Having these hubs means everybody will have the same access. Um, and, and, and also, you know, it, it will reduce that inequality and, and the expertise will be there as well because you can't have too many experts in so many surgeries. Focusing on, on, on small hubs, I think will, will pay dividends in my opinion, but we, we, we need to see that in the future. Now, eight years ago, we did the first, we started this and, and now it's coming to eight years actually, at this point of care devices. And what we're going, we've just been funded, uh, I've just got a, a, a competitive funding from uh, PNG Health uh, for £50,000. It's not a lot of money, but um, it, we are going to repeat all the 300 patients that uh, were part of that study. And we want to see if this point of care devices predicted the development of foot ulcers, amputations. You know, we, we want to see if this early warning 
um, um, equipment's actually predicted because it's eight years since this happened. That's one study we are about to, and we're going to go for ethics approval. It's going to go through Brenda's uh, unit as well for uh, uh, help and advice because we always go to the um, uh, our patient uh, uh, public uh, group, the ladder group in Sheffield. Um, and also second study we, we're I'm applying for, uh, about for, I put into Diabetes UK, it wasn't funded. It was for 600,000 pounds. But we want to see if people that have early neuropathy or actually the neuropathy can be reversed. So these point of care devices that we're using, and it's never been done worldwide. Can we reverse neuropathy? And so with intensive treatment, with intensive multifactorial treatment, what I call improving smoking life, healthy lifestyle, improving blood sugar control, with intensive approach, can we reverse peripheral neuropathy? I think we can. From in type one diabetes, there's all the evidence is already there. Um, and it was published in the New England Journal in, in the DCCT trial. Good blood glucose control actually prevents and reduces a peripheral neuropathy. Um, in type 2 diabetes, there is less evidence, and we want to do another study. And I'm just about to put in that grant application. It wasn't funded by Diabetes UK because there's not a lot of money, um, but I've managed to find another application, and, and uh, we're going to, I'm sure we'll get it funded. Uh, I'm just going to put in that application. There are some questions which I can, if a chairperson allows me to answer quickly on the chat. Yes, you can answer those questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shirley. So, um, a question, thank you for this informative presentation. Could you please highlight some of the early symptoms of painful neuropathy to look out for? So, some of the early signs are that you uh, changes in the, in the feet you might in a toe, uh, you might get a little bit of tingling or unusual sensation. It could be burning type pain, it could be like a electric shock type pain. It could be um, pins and needles, what we call parasthesia um, or um, numbness, dead feeling in the toes. So these are the earliest changes occurring only in a small area. As the neuropathy advances, um, it can, involve the whole leg, uh, unfortunately. And, and, and some people may not even have any symptoms and they might present with a foot ulcer without any symptoms, the neuropathy could be advancing. And the only way to find out this is by actually checking the feet. I will do another, uh, an, another presentation on um, and diabetic peripheral neuropathy. In fact, I'm gonna be recording uh, for an international audience for presentations and and the EAS, the European Diabetes Association website, and there are modules on diabetic neuropathy, which I have done. This is for European, for 20,000 European uh, uh, Diabetes Association members. Um, um, uh, and there are, so it's a free, um, uh, so I will forward those to uh, Lindsay uh, to, to share the links for you to, to learn more about how to um, uh, to learn more about diabetic neur neuropathy. And uh, next question is, how do you prevent neuropathy and to help this? Is the risk of neuropathy higher in type one? No, the risk is exactly the same, depending on the duration of diabetes. So it's the duration of diabetes that dictates how much risk you have. The risk increases of duration diabetes increases, but for the same degree, for the same number of years, um, the, uh, the prevalence is similar to type one and type two, but because type two have had neuropathy for a longer period, it's, it's more common. Um, how soon can uh, one look forward having process one stop in, uh, as usual in, in practice? That is, um, it's, it, it all depends on how we fight for it. If we show the evidence for it, and uh, not only just showing that it can be done, but it is actually beneficial. It's cost effective. Uh, it, it causes, uh, you know, clinical, it is linked to foot problems down the line. Uh, if, if it is compelling, then of course, we can convince uh, the health secretary to adopt this as a standard for the whole of the uh, UK. Is fungal nail symptom uh, a, a symptom of neuropathy? No, it's not. It's a symptom of diabetes, uh, but particularly poor control of diabetes. 
Um, so we see fungal nail problems uh, in, in, in people with diabetes and they can be treated, um, but it is the poor control which, which leads to that. Are there any chemical markers that signify circulation issues? Um, are there any chemical marks that signify circulation issues? Um, you mean a, a poor circulation or microvascular disease? Um, there, there, there are, but not, you know, apart from what we have at the moment is cholesterol, the, the simple LDL cholesterol, particularly um, um, the, these simple markers. But more sophisticated markers, I'm sure, will be emerging that put you at high risk of uh, macro and microvascular disease. In fact, we uh, have, uh, have done a, a review article in the journal Nature. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the top uh, journal, Nature Reviews Endocrinology, and we, we talk about the future of uh, how to detect these uh, um, potential biomarkers of vascular disease, both large and small blood vessels. I'm going to stop there and ask for um, other questions, perhaps from the audience. Uh, how can we prevent neuropathy? We can prevent neuropathy, but first of all, by early detection, very, very early detection, when it is possible to reverse it. It's like anything else. If you have very advanced retinopathy, you can't reverse, it reaches a threshold where you can't reverse. It's like water, you know, if it's boiling, if it reaches, if it reaches a stage of uh, evaporation, um, very difficult to go back to where you started, or you, you might, but um, on the other hand, if you catch it early, you can always reverse things. And I think, um, and people say, well, why, why should we do these tests? Because we should, get good control for everybody and what's the point of screening? I disagree with that profoundly. I think we, we need to do screening because that's what will inspire people to work hard to change their lifestyle when they are starting to have early changes. And if we, if we show them that, they will make the, that effort to, to improve their, their uh, health outcomes. Um, Liz Warren, to everyone, great presentation that I've been saying for years. The toe tickle is not a reliable test. Uh, took part in Manchester Neuropathy study years ago, discovered I couldn't hop from call, but every toe tickle uh, had no problems. That's excellent. So here is a living embodiment. And thank you very much, Liz. You're telling us that uh, you knew this years ago, but that's what NICE is advocating, which is really sad. That's what, we, that's what the, 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 the the, the health service is telling us and when, when you know differently. And, and, and patients and, and, and you know, users should, should be also advocates for change. If it doesn't come from the top, we need to change it. We need to highlight it. We need to write this to the health secretary. You know, it shouldn't be just doctors, nurses or, or healthcare professionals doing it. Um, so re one-stop shop. We, took, we look at other centers in Netherlands, Denmark. It's common sense that this is good for patient and clinic, clinical clinicians. In, in the Netherlands is really good and, and Denmark, but uh, to, be, to be fair, actually, they've learned from us. <laughs> we started it in, 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 um, in uh, Sheffield. Um, and actually, to be fair, other centers also had a one-stop shop like in North Tyneside. Um, um, but um, these sophisticated equipments were introduced here in Sheffield. Now in Aarhus and in, in, uh, in Denmark, where uh, I've given talks in Steno Center in uh, Copenhagen. Now they want to spread this. In fact, they're gonna add other things, autonomic uh, assessment, brain imaging every five years, looking for Alzheimer's, for early detection of other conditions. They are making it even, even enhancing it because they have a lot of money they want to invest in prevention. Whereas in the UK, we're very pragmatic and we just keep on going. What was really interesting today in that really shocking result was also people were satisfied with the treatment they were getting in the UK. 57% of people said they're having good service. And that, that's telling you, it's not the fault of the patients, it's the fault of healthcare professionals. Because if, if it's our fault, if we'd informed 
if we if there was proper education they'd be saying i'm having rubbish service i want my service to improve um, um and what is the treatment of what what is a treatment option available for presumably this is for painful neuropathy we have many treatment options and there are many drugs that we can give in fact we just sent a paper uh, we did the big trial called option dm trial we got three million pounds from uh, the health uh, from uh, the NIHR and Sheffield was led on these. I, 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 I was uh, the chief investigator and the results, we compared all the drugs head to head. Nobody had compared them head to head. I mean, Treptolin, Pregabalin, Duloxetine, the option DM trial, you can have a look at the results in it's, it's, it's already um, in the New England Journal. They wanted to publish it in the, uh, in the NEJM evidence, but uh, I wanted it in the main paper, so I'm going to send it to the Lancet, but the results are available. All the drugs are equivalent, um, but they only offer partial treatment. They don't give full treatment, and, and that result is going to be published. So we do have some, something that we can do for the pain if, if the patients have painful neuropathy as well. Rosie, you got your hand up. What do you want to say? Sorry? Me? You got your hand up, Josie. Were you wanting to ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Um, it's digressing a little bit from the subject we're talking about, but um, in regards to COVID, if one wanted an antibody test, doctor's surgeries don't perform them. Would one have to pay privately for that? Um, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, 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 I, I've got COVID at the moment, and and uh, uh, but I've been pumping myself up because I said I'm not going to miss this <laughs> because um, and I'm feeling better actually, a lot better now. Um, and as soon as I've had t I felt terrible over the weekend, and I, I had the lateral flow test, um, which you can get, um, and then the, for the PCR, if you are a healthcare professional or a relative of a healthcare professional, you can get it free um, at the um, at the hospital, um, at the Northern General Hospital, and I think it should be available for anybody. I would have thought who who has who has a positive lateral flow test. If that's not the case, uh, uh, I would complain to the to general practice. Does anybody have any better information on that? I was told when I rang, uh, when I did ring the surgery and asked them if I could have one, they said no, because otherwise everyone would want an antibody test. And uh, the only way I could get one is when I did ring 111 was for them to tell me that you can have an antibody test that is sent out randomly if you have a positive COVID. Um, but obviously I didn't have a positive COVID test because I really didn't want one. Um, but it was just the way in which she said that the government only send them out randomly to people. So it's not always a, uh, a definite, yes, if you have had a positive COVID test, you can have an antibody test. And it's usually a finger prick test, not a blood sample. Okay. Um What are the main barriers against developing a one-stop service, which seems to be a common sense, effective approach? David, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, uh, but we need to study them. Um, um, what, what we need to study them. What I mean by that is there are patient factors. Like today, again, in this two-hour session that I about uh, paid, uh, this was about painful neuropathy. Um, we know what needs to be done in general practice. Everybody with painful neuropathy, for instance, should, should get medication. That's not happening. And there are patient factors, and there are people who don't want any medication, uh, who have uh, who have that stigma and don't want to talk, don't want to visit hospital because they're scared of amputations. A lot of things came up out of, out of that. We need to know the barriers from the patient point of view. We also need to know what are the processes in general practice that don't allow for this. What emerged from the UK was that there is no contact with patients. And when, even when patients want to visit a GP, they're not getting that opportunity. 
the, the other healthcare professionals such as nurses don't even talk about painful neuropathy because they don't know much about it. And which was, again, you know, we need not only just to empower the general practitioners to have a better understanding of uh, neuropathy, but everybody that's connected with diabetes needs to know. So they, they will know how to signpost people. So I think we need implementation medicine, not the signs. So new signs is not just good enough to put um, these directives, these, um, um, or what do you call them, these guidelines, um, that is actually seen in practice what works. And, and, and uh, um, some work needs to be done this. And I think, uh, I'm sure Kerry and colleagues in, in Sheffield have thought about this and, and, and will in, in, in the next you know, few years or so, will improve these uh, pathways and to make them more effective more robust and, and uh, or inclusive uh, and, and um, uh, cater for everybody. For instance, people with type one diabetes, they don't, they, they, they don't wanna come to clinics or hubs. Uh, they, they're too busy, they've got, they need evening uh, sessions, which we did in Sheffield. So the one-stop shop, we got a prize for that as well. My colleague, Jackie uh, Elliott uh, got one of the national uh, prizes for arranging a, um, the one-stop shop uh, after work hours. We need to do it over in weekends. We need to make it flexible for, for people with diabetes. Thank you, very good answers, I'm sure. Thank you, David. Hi, right, Liz, oh. I think you've had your, you had your hand up first. Do you want to ask a question? Yes, I've actually got a couple of questions. Um, First of all, thanks for the presentation. And it's really, really impressive to hear a, a clinician talking in this way about um, changing things that, that suit for the patient's benefit and not just for the clinician's benefit. Um, a few things. First of all, the, the cost of the piece of equipment that you use to um, do a, a more in-depth test for neuropathy as opposed to just tickling the toes. I'd like to know that. And then secondly, um, I'd just like to make the point that I'm, I've been doing a lot of work with Diabetes UK and with, with the, the, the research groups that they, they run. And we've been looking at aging well with diabetes and I don't think I'm the only one on this call who is um, past retirement age. Um, but the people, people I've spoken to at length, people who've had their, got their medals like I have for you know, 50, 60, 70 years of diabetes are terrified of, of having to go into a nursing home or care home. And I, I think that we need, I just, this is just a point really, but I, I, I think you'd be sympathetic to it. I think we need at least one or possibly regional centers for people with type one or people with complex type two in, in care settings, nursing homes, um, if they're no longer able to care for themselves. And I know there's a consultation closing today that Professor Alan Sinclair has done on um, guidance for care homes, but he's got nothing about type one. We must, must have a center of excellence in the same way that your, your one-stop shops are, are, are centers of excellence. And then, then thirdly, I just want to know about the tests for neuropathy of the gut. So if you get gastroparesis, so that your digestive system is slow, is there anything you can, can, can you explain what that test is and, and how, how reliable it is? Because I've been told, because I've got type one, I can't have the test. Right, uh, Liz, uh, have you got a couple of hours? Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, but these were very, very important questions. I, I want to answer them quickly. Um, so let's start with your first, uh, Kerry, do you want to say, do you want to come in? So I just wanted to say I've got to go, unfortunately, and tend to my poorly dog. So right. if that's OK, everybody, great to see everyone. And thank you ever so much for being able to come along and say a few words as well. And um, I will just drop off the call now, if that's yeah. OK. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Really, Bye -bye. I really appreciate that particularly when you have a very poorly dog and you have to take yeah, it. Yes, yeah, right. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.
okay. So Liz, let's tackle your questions. So the first question was, uh, remind me. Um, the cost, the cost of the equipment. So the, the equipment, are the, the pseudo scan costs 26,000 euros, but does not require any, uh, any consumables. So you have an equipment and you'll use it forever. So it's, 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 a, it's an expensive piece of equipment. Um, now, when, when you look at one amputation, now one amputation costs the health service of 50,000 pounds in hospital costs alone. Mm -hmm. The cost of investigation, the cost of uh, uh, bypass, uh, all, all patients have, uh, and the cost of rehabilitation. That doesn't include the, the cost to the patient, to society, lost time from work, um, to the family, earning capacity. I mean, uh, I'm not a health economist, but um, it don't, um, so that's the first equipment. The other equipment is the handheld device that costs 1000 US dollars, but it requires consumables, uh, uh, electrodes that you use, uh, that have to, you have to change every two or three people. Um, you wipe it and 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 uh, for COVID and and check and and so um, so they are not cheap. Whereas a monofilament costs about fifteen quid, so there's a huge difference. Um, but one is completely west of time, which gives, in fact, it's dangerous because it misleads people. Yeah. And, and but we need to look at cost effectiveness. And I I I, I have I have been part of Nice. Uh, I've served in all really neuropathy nice committees. And one of the things that I've cautioned is let's have a look at cost effectiveness uh, from chronic complication, let's model it. And it, 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 I'm absolutely certain these, if you look at cancer diagnosis, they're all expensive stuff. And if you want something that's required a lot of input to it, it's gonna be expensive, but in the long run, it gets cheaper if it's widely used and they, because the price will go down. Um, but um, studies need to be done to address this. And, and that's one of the things we want to do in, in this uh, pilot work that we are doing. Your second question, uh, Liz. Oh, that was really the comment about having a center of excellence for um, nursing homes for elderly people. Yeah, who and, and, and again, it, it, that is going to be factored in this uh, one-stop shop. The one-stop shop, if they can't come to us, we're going to go through them, um, particularly nursing homes, because these equipments that we use are completely objective. Even if you don't have, um, if you don't, if you have cognitive impairment, it doesn't matter. You just check, you just touch, uh, you, you can measure the, uh, the level of neuropathy by, the, and you get quantitative figure. And that's the beauty of these uh, it needs proper strategy for nursing homes, particularly with complex type one diabetes. That is a discussion for another time, but, but I agree there is, uh, considering that we have a huge population at the moment, which is gonna grow, um, not enough emphasis has been put into this. Uh, I know Alan Sinclair very well. In fact, I wrote the book chapter for his book on, on neuropathy, neuropathy in the elderly. Um, and, and that's something, I wasn't aware of it, sadly, to, to have uh, given an input in that. Although I'm in the Diabetes UK Complications Group, I'm actually a member of the Diabetes UK uh, uh, Complications Group, and I've put in neuropathy and foot problems now as the top priorities for Diabetes UK. It wasn't previously, um, but ever since joining this about eight years ago, it's now a, a, quite a priority, amputations. There's been a, a, a new, uh, commissioned uh, funding for the diabetic foot. Um, in fact, I'm reviewing all the grants for, from a national grant for uh, um, April. Uh, for, so I'm going to go to London and, and to award. So um, and I think it's important to work with Diabetes UK. And your final question on gastroparesis. Uh, gastroparesis, we have got a service in Sheffield for gastroparesis. Uh, we have treatments for it. There are many tr treatments for gastroparesis. There are these are drug-based drug uh, medications that are taken orally, intranasally, um, and that improve gastric emptying. And we have tests for it. Um, and, and whether you have type one diabetes or type two diabetes doesn't matter. Um, um, I, I need to talk to you because that's a lecture for another time. Um, but 
um, so we've got um, 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 Professor Mark McLinden, who works at Hallamshire, is our advisor here. And people with intractable gastroparesis, we refer them to Leeds to have gastric pacing. They can have a pacemaker put in, in their stomach to help them. So uh, um, it's, it, there is a, um, a strategy for it, a treatment strategy, and we have a clinic for it. So, and there's Botox treatment as well that, uh, to, that we provide at the, in Sheffield uh, through endoscopy. So um, again, maybe, the, we, maybe you weren't aware of this service. And again, it's our fault for not making this uh, uh, known in Sheffield. And, and the service being publicised. Sorry, I'm, I'm actually in London. That's that's uh, probably why. Well, Liz, are you in London then? Yes. <laughs> Come to Sheffield and everything will be sorted. Uh, yeah. yeah. I can, I, but I can introduce you if you're in London. Uh, uh, there are some friends of mine, Prash Vaz in, in King's, who provide uh, uh, similar services. And, so, uh, and I can uh, introduce you to people. I've who... met him, I've met him actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Hi, Brenda. I think you had your hand up next. Yeah. Um, I presume that while, while you're doing a trial, it wouldn't be feasible. But one possibility might be to, um, whenever anybody goes for an eye test, um, especially at the Northern General or the um, Hallamshire, which are probably the bigger areas, to give them the facility to actually ask for a one stop job one one stop shop treatment for foot care um, because you could then monitor that and you could then say to the authorities look this number of people have gone for their eye test and they've actually asked for it so that might help to justify um, that people do want it do you think that would be useful Think, I think it would be wonderful. And that's what we're thinking about. Uh, Brenda, what we are planning to do, in fact, is exactly what you said. You always come up with really interesting comments, as usual. And we need to be there for people, um, provide one-stop shop for younger people with diabetes, um, provide services where people will come. Many people come to, for the eye clinic. They have a lot of problems. They can easily go to seafloor and have blood tests done at the Hallamship, and they can they can have everything done. They can have a foot check. So we are planning to provide the one-stop service at the major hospitals, because it is easy access, and and um, it can be provided very easily. And um, and so that's amongst our plan for Sheffield. Yeah. Thank you. I think if you do that, it's important to monitor how many people actually ask for it because you can use that as a business justification then. If we, if we put it out there, everybody will use it. Whenever I offer people, uh, you're coming to eye clinic, I want you to have blood tests done. They grab it because it just means they don't have to uh, go to GP, wait and, and, and make an appointment. It, it's so much easier. Yeah. People, yeah. people will vote with their feet, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, done. <laughs> I think as well, though, that you, when the letter goes out inviting you, you should also have on that letter that you can have a one-stop shop because uh, people aren't aware of it. Exactly. And I think one of the things we need to do is publicity uh, to make it easy for people. And on once we've done the one-stop shop as well, we need to have an A4. Uh, which I call an A4 or a uh, paper with all their results. Um, and so they get everything in, in that A4 paper um, and, and, and which tells them they are the, 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 the drivers of their treatment. And so they, they, they need to seek treatment um, because it will tell to them, this is what you should do when you have this and will give the targets, the advised targets to achieve and how they can get it. So they will be uh, the drivers of their treatment. Yeah, because that's one thing you're not told is 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 what you're aiming for, what your targets are. It's all going to. You're oblivious to that. Clearly, it's it's all going to change. Yeah, Lindsay, I think you've got a question. Lindsay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, 
this is really interesting, all this, um, Solomon, and I'm thinking we could probably do a full page feature in the news brief all about the one stop shop. That's one thing. Um, the second thing I want to say is that the eye screening people are really kind um, and very, very good. And I think they their attitude really contributes to people feeling confident about going for the screening. But um, my third thing is, um, I don't know why complications are called complications because they are obviously they do complicate your diabetes but like everything complicates my diabetes like the weather or whether I sleep too much or don't sleep enough or did I miscalculate how many carbs are in a pancake you know whatever so I think life with diabetes is complicated and I think it would be much nicer to say there are risks associated with diabetes, some long term risks. Um, because I think the other thing is you're not 100% guaranteed to get these complications. Um, they are risks. I realise that would be like changing the whole world. <laughs> word, but, um, I'm not sure why it's called complications. Uh, uh, they are called complications, Lindsay, because um, what, if you get something that affects you, like neuropathy, you can't feel your foot, um, yeah. it's not a risk anymore. A risk is something that can happen, um, you know, that, that can happen. Uh, when you have something that is uh, unwanted, it is actually a complication. It is, it's a, a terrible thing to happen. Um, and, and I don't like the word complication, I agree with you, because I think the word complication means um, that you can't, it is complicated and that you can't do anything about it. And I don't like that. Yeah. Um, we, perhaps we need a better word for it. Um, but maybe risk is not um, um, the, the word for it. I think we need to think of something that will inspire people to, <coughs> to change. And not to be defeated by it, but uh, to, to because if you look at the diabetic foot, and people will have a small problem, which will grow, which will uh, get worse and worse, worse. Okay, um, but we can treat it at all points, and we can stop the the development of diabetes if if we really have an intensive approach. If you have diabetes, we can stop the the, the development of diabetic complications like neuropathy by good treatment of the diabetes. Even if you develop complications, you can prevent further complications such as foot ulceration in a vulnerable diabetic foot with neuropathy by having appropriate footwear, by having regular podiatry, um, by um, good education uh, of what not to do. Um, and even if you have an, a, a, a foot ulceration, it needn't lead to amputation if you can get it healed and again have footwear so uh, even if you have uh, do you know what i mean you can manage all the problems at various time points and therefore i don't like that it is something that that's going to defeat uh, us defeat people with diabetes all of us and i think um somehow the word complication doesn't capture it and i agree with you lindsay we need to rethink that word. Let's have a Twitter poll on it. Put a tweet out and, and ask all the thousands of people in the UK what word yep. they prefer. And you get lots of ideas there. In, in, in Within an hour, you get 100 answers. Fantastic, Liz. Excellent. Competition. Right, Samantha, you've got a question? Um, yeah. I do. I'm just wondering for the one-stop service, um, so should type 3 diabetes also available for this service as well? But I'm not sure whether type 3 diabetes will have the same neuropathy, the effect same as type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, all forms of diabetes, Samantha, uh, high blood sugar 
results in neuropathy. Um, any kind of diabetes. I mean, if we take, for instance, if you have a, a pancreatic insufficiency uh, uh, causing uh, diabetes, secondary diabetes, for instance, um, uh, if it's prolonged and the sugar has built up in the, and it's not treated, it will lead to neuropathy. High blood glucose um, is uh, damaging to blood vessels both the small blood vessels and large blood vessels. And the cause of diabetic peripheral neuropathy is poor circulation of the nerves. And, and, and again, these studies came from Sheffield. Professor John Ward, do, do you know, do you remember Professor Ward? Any of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah you remember him hazily, yes. I do. And yeah. John Ward was my, my boss and who really inspired me to go into the neuropathy field and Sheffield is, um, is, uh, is a world leader in, in uh, diabetic uh, neuropathy and a lot of the work in the 80s and my own work, uh, my PhD when I did research showed that actually is a circulation of the nerves which is disturbed that causes diabetic nerve damage and so all types of diabetes um, if it is not controlled will lead to diabetic peripheral neuropathy. The risk factors are there. Can I ask a question? Please. You mentioned the research done eight years ago. Yes. Uh, I believe, I, I, to be honest, I used to be a patient of yours. And I found whenever I came to see you, I ended up volunteering to do some research. Yes. <laughs> which was a bit of, you know, a knack you had persuade somebody to do some research and eight years ago I believe I was part of the neuropathy research was it an Australian or uh, the research colleague a female oh um, Dr Marnie Greg that's it Marnie I couldn't remember her name yes. is that the research well we, we do so many research you know I know half, I remember half of, half of <laughs> Sheffield half of my my colleagues were my own research fellows. So okay. Dr. Marnie Greg, Dr. Rajiv Gandhi. Marnie, say, she was the Greg. lady who I was with. So, so uh, Dr. Selvaraja, all of them went through the neuropathies. One, yeah. way, one way of recruiting people to be diabetes doctors for Sheffield is uh, both myself and Professor Heller uh, have trained people to be uh, our colleagues. Yeah. Um, and and um, Dr. Marnie Gregg's work is amazing. She's done really, and again, I, I will present some of her work. She's yeah. actually presented at the American Diabetes Association. We're looking at the, what we've shown in Sheffield, one of the things that we've shown is that a lot of people thought diabetic peripheral neuropathy just affected the feet. The nerves were damaging the feet. That's not actually true. Because again, a lot of the answer came from people like yourself, uh, Hazel, and from um, many of my, my patients in Sheffield. And a lot of them were disabled with poor sleep, with um, uh, anxiety and depression because it's continuous pain. And what I saw when I saw people coming from all over the UK, indeed outside UK coming to Sheffield with painful symptoms was that most of them were, the problem was up here. Mm -hmm. And I started to think, where is the pain? Is it in the feet or is it in the brain? So we did, started to do brain imaging work and we found actually the there is cortical reorganization of the pain processing areas of the brain and most of our now the world's completely changed now and again we published this in 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 nature reviews endocrinology and and last year's uh, nobel prize win uh, nobel prize winning was on um, that came from uh, a chap called dr julius um, who published these receptors in, in the uh, uh, receptors in, in the skin that tell you that you're having pain. And um, they published all the papers published in Nature and Sheffield's paper was part of that public with uh, part of that publication um, and list. So uh, uh, so we, we we are getting because unless you know the pr processes taking place in the brain where pain is felt, you'll never develop the right kind of 
medications. Because the current medications we have like pregabalin, duloxetine, uh, amitriptyline, morphine, kill the patient, kill the pain, but also the patient. They disable people. If you try these drugs, the pain gets better, but it also causes problems with concentration. And, and that's because we don't understand the mechanisms of pain in the brain. What Sheffield is doing now is we're really at the cutting edge of understanding how pain is processed in the brain by using MRIs uh, technology. And Brenda will tell you, um, she's evaluated many of the studies that we, we do in Sheffield. They go through the ladder program. Um, and um, although I'm over 60, I won't tell you how old I am. Um, I, I want to carry on. I want to carry on researching this because it, I'm passionate about it. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, okay, you know, let, let others take other responsibility. I can do a little bit of research and help about. And we want to carry on because I think with, without, and that is the beauty of research in Sheffield. It's, it's the patients who provide us. It's our patient panel who give us the advice on how to design these studies. We don't come and manufacture them in a, in a laboratory or in, a, in, a, in our rooms or in, in libraries. Uh, we ask our panel, what should we do for this condition? And the panel tell us, well, I think you should do this. They give us advice so that we, we come up with the answers that address the concerns of uh, our, our people to advance the science quicker. So can I go back to the original? That, again, very interesting. You mentioned the people from eight years ago would be called upon again. And, and that, that is for the one-stop shop. In the one-stop shop, we found that 50% of people attending had neuropathy. Yeah. These are unselected 50%. If we use a point of care device, the handheld device, 50% of them had neuropathy. Um, uh, whereas if you use the monofilament, you only diagnose neuropathy in 14%. And what we want to know is what's happened to these people who had an abnormal, does an abnormal, um, um, these function tests, that they, that, does it predict hospital admission down the line? Does it um, lead to foot ulceration? Does it predict um, amputation? We're looking at that. Uh, we're not actually repeating the people that had the brain imaging work, mm -hmm. although it would be wonderful to do that mm -hmm. uh, if we got the money for it, to just see what changes there are in the brain function. That's something I also want to do. Yeah. It's just getting the funding, which is not easy, uh, Hazel, as you can imagine. But well, thank you very much for your You're for your pretty time. good at getting funding. I don't know that. I remember very well. <laughs> we try our best. <laughs> yeah. And you've Thank funded you. me. Sheffield Diabetes UK has funded me to the tune of about twenty thousand pounds over the years from the collections that he, that that you that you uh, which I'm for which I'm extremely grateful. Do you have any other questions? Is it possible to share the URL for that piece of research looking at the? The brain and how 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 it interprets or or whatever it is pain linked to neuropathy. I'd really like to read that. Okay, well, Liz, it, um, I can um, if you if you send me an email, I'll send you the papers for you to read. Um, or you can you can if you put Solomon Tesfaye on Google, um, and. Uh, um, you can download a lot of our our, our papers from. Uh, okay. but, but I can, but I can um, I can, if you send me an email, it's Solomon at Um At least we can we can communicate, and um, um, Diabetes UK has actually publicised this and um, um, and given me an award for it, the Arnold Bloom Award, um, and also the European Diabetes Association also recognized it and, and I got the Camilo Golgi Prize of the European Diabetes Association for, uh, for, uh, um, for research in, in diabetic neuropathy. In fact, my presentation at the Camilo Golgi Prize ceremony, the full lecture, one hour in front of 20,000 people, it's online. You can listen to it and you can listen to the 
I'll send you the link to it because I think that probably will capture, um, it's, a, it's, it's really our research in Sheffield and, uh, and um, uh, you, you can listen to it if, if you have the time that is. Could you I'd send it to Lindsay please so that she can circulate it to, our, to us? Okay, I, I'll, I'll pass it to Lindsay. Uh, we've got a question uh, from David. He says, um, I'm a type 1 diabetic. I've recently been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Does this increase the risk of peripheral neuropathy? No, it doesn't. Um, and so um, there is no link between um, rheumatoid arthritis and peripheral neuropathy. Um, but um, having uh, rheumatoid arthritis sometimes can cause a, um, a problem with the flexor retinaculum, we call it, it's just in the, in the wrist here, and it can cause carpal tunnel syndrome, so you can get sort of um, an, an, a nerve English. which is entrapped here, causing uh, what we call carpal tunnel syndrome, it causes pain in the hands, um, and it can be treated by an injection or it, by carpal tunnel release. Um, uh, but um, so, but but there isn't a link actually with the problems in the foot. Okay, thanks. I've been uh, diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome as well, so it's all linked. It is linked. Yeah, they... with, yeah, it was diabetes, and 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 there is something we can do for it. If you have a problem with that, please get your GP to refer you to me. Uh, we can make a proper diagnosis using nerve conduction studies. We, and we'll know whether it's mild, moderate or severe. And depending on the severity, we can refer you to the hand unit to have treatment. I had it myself. Mine was mild uh, and it was treated with injection and it cured it. Um, but others may have more severe. And if that's more severe, then they may need a, a surgical just release um, here that's done by um, at the, the hand center at the north. Thank you. Oh, uh, there's another question from Lindsay and David. Um, Solomon, why does the hospital do the tickly toe test when basically you're saying it's unhelpful? A uh, very, very important question that. Why do we do it? We do it as a, t uh, uh, it's a predictor of two things. It's a predictor of foot ulceration. When you can't feel that, it means you have advanced peripheral neuropathy and you can develop foot ulceration. And therefore, we, at that point, we give patients advice and foot care. So not to walk barefoot, uh, not to wear specialized footwear. And when they go on holiday, not to buy cheap shoes um, because they can't feel the, the heat of the water when they, they don't plunge their feet in into a bath. So they just need to be, it's a, it's a, it's a warning, if you like. It's a simple cheap test to tell uh, the, the patient and ask, that the patient has barn door neuropathy. They have got definite neuropathy, uh, but not early neuropathy. Does that answer your question, Lindsay? It does, but um, it just strikes me that if we're at a specialist centre at the hospital, then it'd be much more helpful to find out whether we've got the early signs of predictable neuropathy and, and i agree i think in the future it's going to disappear once we have these point of care devices because they are quite quantitative if it is uh, it, it, they give you a range between early and very severe so you don't need at the moment we're doing it because it's better than nothing it's it's it, it, it's just trying to to ensure that at least people are having the minimum it's not it's not good but it's something that to have, but in the future, it, it will be obsolete. I've got another question from Vanessa. Does neuropathy affect the hands? Yes, it does. So it's a distal axonopathy, as I mentioned, it affects the longest nerves. So the nerves of the hands come from the neck. So they go through the arm, uh, all the way to the tips of the, so the, the, so the distance from the neck from the spinal cord in the neck to the hands, uh, <coughs> and the distance from the back, the lower back to the toes um, is different. 
So once it reaches, uh, once it reaches uh, the, the distance, once the neuropathy is, uh, it affects the longest nerves, uh, it reaches about mid shin in the leg, then the hands start to get affected. It, it makes sense. So it's, it, it affects the longest nerves. And at, at one point it will affect the nerves of the hands. So the early symptoms are in the feet and legs, and, but it, with more advanced disease, the hands are affected. And hand neuropathy is really bad because uh, the hand is an extension of our, uh, our uh, brain. The first thing we do is touch something. You lose the, the, the function of your hand. It, it's, it's bad to lose the function of the leg. You lose the hand uh, grip or your ability to uh, find movements of the hand it is terribly disabling because there's nothing you can do about it. We can provide them implements, you know, um, that are easy to grip, you know, there's um, all sorts of uh, things that we can do, but hand neuropathy is the worst. It is uh, truly uh, disabling. When you, if you can't sign your check, uh, your checkbook, or if you can't um, uh, button, it, it just, it, it's, it's awful. Right, Brenda, you've got a question? Yeah, the point uh, that David mentioned about arthritis, um, do you think that some healthcare professionals, particularly nurses at GP surgeries, um, might uh, confuse arthritis um, for neuropathy, particularly in older people where they might say, oh, you're getting older, it'll be arthritis. Brenda, um, uh, don't don't get me attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any nurses here? Uh, the truth is, the level of knowledge is not very good, and yeah. and that is because it's not the fault of the the the, the nurses. Yeah. They need an updated. It having assessment of the diabetic foot and that, the, the hands is. I have done it for so many years. And, and I was invited to the Mayo Clinic. You know, it's, 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 it's a small town of 100,000 people, but 50% of the population are working in the hospitals. And put it this way, they've got a 250 MRI scans. In Sheffield, we've got about 10. And, and, and it's a massive place in Rochester, Minnesota. And my mentor, the Professor Peter Dick, he's 90 years old now, and he's still going strong invited experts from all over the world and asked us to examine patients on two occasions. First day was they had masks and this is about 10 years ago and we couldn't tell who they were uh, and we examined their feet and legs to diagnose neuropathy. And then the following day, we, they took their masks off. We examined them in a random order. Let alone nurses, even experts can't get the diagnosis of peripheral neuropathy correct. And these are neurologists, top people. Um, at, the, at the extreme ends of uh, uh, proper sensation, no sensation, it's very easy to diagnose neuropathy. But where there are little signs and symptoms, it's very difficult using clinical methods, using tuning fork to diagnose accurately peripheral neuropathy. So if it is really, and so what the result of that study was even experts don't get it right. And, and so what, what it, this tells us is that if, if, if experts can't get it right, how likely is it um, um, some uh, nurses who are trying to do everything, asthma clinics, uh, pregnancy clinics, uh, arthritis clinics, how, with all the different things that they do, how likely are they gonna get it, nail it to be right? Very wow. difficult. And so that's why we want to take it away from healthcare professionals. Let the equipment diagnose neuropathy. Um, it's like eye screening. Previously, we used to use the ophthalmoscope and I used to fiddle. I had a patient, 30 patients coming to a clinic, putting in eye drops in, in, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was looking in the back of the eyes. Okay, I had some idea, but not to like a, an expert ophthalmologist and dilated pupil sometimes. But we were missing a lot of retinopathy. But it, when it was taken away from doctors because we are a liability, uh, it was taken, done by experts uh, who, who, who take pictures and these are graded properly and it goes to an ophthalmologist. 
that became a game changer. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that the healthcare professionals that do these are very well trained, providing their services in hubs, and they're doing it all the time, not in one in 30 patients that they see. And, and so the whole thing needs to change. And that's why we have these hubs to provide almost expert care, a very well, good care. We're using excellent equipment, which provide reproducible results rather than just a, a guesswork. One of the things that we realize when people come to the foot clinic is, we know everybody that comes to the foot clinic has neuropathy. 95% of people that attend foot clinic have peripheral neuropathy. But when we look at their system one, they don't have neuropathy, which is shocking. Why? Because they, they, it was not done properly by the GP or by the nurses. They haven't got time. The, the, it's just a cursory thing to just take their shoes and socks off and, 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 and the pulses are not done properly. And, and that is, they have a lot of pressure on them as well, you know, to deliver, to speed up. And, and so we need to make it a robust system that diagnoses correctly to, uh, gives correct diagnosis to our patients. Um, somebody's asking questions. Uh, Josie's got a hand up. Yes. Um, uh, neuropathy in the hands. Could one of the symptoms of that be pins and needles? Sorry? For neuropathy in the hands, could one of the symptoms be pins and needles? Absolutely. In fact, that is the main symptom. So if you get pins and needles in the fingers, um, um, if, it, if it comes just once in a blue moon, it could be because you pressed a nerve or you, you banged your, um, one of the nerves in the elbow. Um, but if it is continuous tingling in your fingers, could be the sign of carpal tunnel syndrome or peripheral neuropathy. Because right. I had a, a nerve conduction test because I do have pins and needles in one hand and arm. But the, um, the nerve conduction test didn't show any problems at all. But there seems to be, when you do visit the doctor, there seems to be no explanation as to why do I have pins and needles in my hand and arm? That's a very good question. That's because you haven't seen me. Uh, because um, the nerve conduction only measure large fiber function. Yeah. So the wires that we have, the, the nerves that we have, are small fibers that, that, that you cannot, nerve conduction does tell you anything about them, but you can detect small fiber damage by warm thresholds and heat thresholds. And, and we have that facility in Sheffield and you can have it in our lab and they can do quantitative sensory testing. But the large fibers, if you, you know, uh, um, are diagnosed using the nerve conduction. So you could still have peripheral neuropathy. Um, and so um, I would suggest uh, you, Josie, uh, ask your GP if you still have the problem uh, for you to come and see me in clinic. Okay, thank you. That's another question. Yes, um, Lindsay wants to know, Solomon, what you would have done if you hadn't gone into medical school and... Um, what made you so interested in diabetes? Now, Lindsay, I don't want you to make me cry because I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think um, um, you need to, re there's a, there's a, my life story has been written in, in the Lancet and um, just put Solomon test by because I, I went to diabetes because I, to, to, to do medicine um, because of a, a family tragedy. So I, 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 have a read, if you put Solomon test by Lancet, um, and my mother died when she was young, and because I, um, and uh, I come from Africa, a, a poor country, um, and uh, I wanted to do medicine. Um, and it's it's following the um, the prize, the Golgi Prize in the in the in Europe. They uh, they uh, they did a, a, a um, what do you call a profile? The the Lancet is a, a journal in the UK. I, I'm sure you know. And, and they did a full, a full page on it. So, um, but, but I think 
forgetting my, my individual story, I, I have had, um, in Sheffield, I've attended many funerals, um, sad to say. Um, I've had, I, I mean, a, a, about a year ago I went because a family asked me to attend, um, um, I won't mention her name, um, but they attended her. It, 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 it is a condition which causes, uh, particularly with the gastroparesis and the um, awful, and if, it, if people in some, in not in all patients, but in, in some patients has awful. And, and um, I've, I've said, it's not about any of us, it's about, it's about patients. I never get nervous when I, I get nervous in small groups or something like that when I'm talking to people. But whenever I give a lecture in, to big audiences, I don't because I never think about me, about, it's about patience. And when you think about patients and people that suffer, um, it, 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 that's what makes passion. And, and my title of the Golgi Prize was um, um, a journey with uh, passion, um, and uh, something, uh, uh, it, it, passion comes out of just trying to, to, to do something, to do something for, for, to ease the suffering that um, quite a lot of people, unfortunately, have with this uh, horrible, complica uh, complica horrible something of, uh, of okay. diabetes. Yes. Thank you. So is there any other questions for Solomon? Can't see any. I think there was one. I think Kushler uh, said um, she mentions that she went on Monday to the Royal Hallamshire Hospital for her eyes tested and asked about um, something else. It must have been a feet. And um, the lady said that they only did feet checks at the Northern General. So <laughs> you, know, you want to put Kushler's mind at rest about? Yeah, uh, and the, the one stop shop we provide um, pre at, the, at the Northern because we, we've got a diabetes centre and there is no room for it, unfortunately, at the Hallamshire mm. at the moment in the eye, in the eye uh, unit. Whereas uh, in, at the Northern, the eye screening is done in the diabetes centre, in the diabetes and endocrine centre, and there is a podiatrist there. So we do the foot check. Um, I think um, if I'm... Uh, I, the problem is, I mean, uh, Elizabeth Robertson, Dr. Elizabeth Robertson, a very good friend at the Diabetes UK, and um, and the um, Diabetes UK is very fully supportive of this uh, one-stop shop. Um, but um, everybody tells me we need more evidence. I don't know what more evidence people want, but um, but unfortunately, um, you know, I, I want to write to the, once we get these hubs and the report is okay. Um, I don't think we need to do further studies. I'm going to go to Sajid uh, uh, Health Secretary um, and just say, look, do something, okay. you know, do something that the UK is a developed country. And if we provide MOT for, for, for cars, we can provide better service for people with diabetes, truly. And, and, um, uh, and the, it makes sense. And, and, you know, it avoids all this repetitive. For blood pressure alone, people are, um, to have it checked, you know, for all these between six and 12 visits to GP practice in a year, which is totally unnecessary. Uh, most of it is unnecessary. Um, and a lot of it can be driven by self-management. Blood pressure doesn't have to be checked in the general practice. Patients uh, appropriately funded um, can afford, um, you know, a, a blood pressure machine. I'm, I've got, uh, I mean, uh, my blood pressure is a little elevated. I've been doing a, a blood pressure check myself and um, it's tittering between, um, and it's 20 pounds. Yeah. And, and, and so I think we, the whole thing needs changing. The whole system needs changing. Um, but I'm sure we will win because uh, we've got right on our side. I think in some practices as well, they have a, a blood pressure monitor that's um, it, in reception where you can go and, you know, use it yourself, yeah. um, which, you know, it's, it saves you having to wait to see your uh, nurse. I know I went to have my blood pressure checked and she did say, have you taken your blood pressure tablet? I went, well, they never told me I had to. So, <laughs> so I said, you know, I tested it at home. So I went home and did a week's test and then took it back. 
Uh, but nobody told me that I got to take my blood pressure tablet before I had my blood pressure tested. So I mean, I'd I, been I having it done for the last I last three I, years and nobody nobody mentioned. I always advise my, my patients, and some people have said to me, look, you, you shouldn't confront patients, uh, to ask them, because some patients may not be able to afford it, and there's no doubt about that. In £10, £20 is a lot of money. But actually, for many patients, for 95% of uh, our patients, it's an, a, a very important investment, having a blood pressure machine. Good blood pressure is a better uh, predictor of death yeah. than actually blood sugar. And, and, and it's something that can be easily treated, unlike blood sugar. You know, you can th throw tablets at it and it, 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 it's like cholesterol. You can, if you take medication, blood sugar is a lot more complex to manage. And, and I think, um, but the good thing is that most people have good blood pressure um, uh, compared to blood glucose, where, we, where it is a bit difficult to achieve better, better control. Thank you. So if there's um, no more questions, I will say thank you very much, Solomon, for... I think, I think uh, Jamanji has, has raised her hand. Yes, she did, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Go on. You're, you're muted. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I was just saying that I went to the Hallamshire because I live close to it. I can walk to it. So next year, I'll go for my eye appointment at the Northern General. Well done, Kushla. <laughs> to have the full works done. <laughs> As yeah. can all of you. <laughs> yeah. And that, well, that's the thing, I think, because when you get the letter, you have a choice, don't you? You flip that's over right. the back and you have a list of where, where you can go. Uh, and, you know, you sort of try and pick the one that's nearest to you, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Can can I just say something else? Yes. That's not totally correct. I have been a patient at the Royal Hallamshire too long to remember, but since I moved across the border into Derbyshire, I cannot have my eye screening done at the Royal Hallamshire or the Northern General, even though I'm a patient at the Hallamshire. So what's happened there? And that, that that is really shocking, you know, because it I is think, shocking, yeah. But but the 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 uh, I can't say I need to political correctness again here, but some some parts of uh, outside Sheffield uh, are actually are, the diabetes care is terrible. It's horrendous. Uh, I know. It's horrendous, yeah. and, and I yeah. get so many patients um, from these neighbouring places with. The most advanced problems and um, um, just my heart sinks um, it, it just takes a long time it took me an hour and a half with a patient once um, uh, just two weeks ago to sort to try and decipher and and um, you know when you have 15 minutes allocated always my clinics are running until 2 p.m every every Thursday and because of uh, from Derbyshire, it is terrible. We're it, it can't even get some the, the blood tests even are not even done, and 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 I think this needs sorting. And again, Sheffield CCG, the CCGs need to work together to yeah. try and coordinate. Part of the problem is that a lot of the doctors in these hospitals don't have the same. We have a little bit of luxury here in Sheffield. We've got a lot of consultants uh, compared to Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham and, and Chesterfield. And, and in, in some ways, um, it's not fair of us to criticise the services because we just simply have a, a, a better, better resources here. Mm. Um, but the sad thing is it's all postcode lottery. It's, it's where you are and, and what kind of treatment you get. And... This is not only the case just here, it's also in London. I, there's a patient from outside London who is a, a, a daughter of a Cambridge University student, no less, who's well-educated, should, uh, should knows what to do, but actually was actually having fainting, having with type one diabetes in with, with terrible uh, um, hypoglycemic attacks and from outside London. Of course, I referred her to, um, he's now gone to Leicester, um, uh, Pratik Chowdhury, 
and he sorted everything and and because he was at, working at King's at that point and got her on CGM and everything. So there's huge variation. One of the things I've advised Diabetes UK to do, particularly for type one diabetes management is to do actually a proper, um, what do you call, um, analysis of what's happening at the moment. You know, uh, uh, how patients are being managed, what, whether Daphne is available, whether all these resources that we find in some centers are available. And you find that there is huge disparity on the level of quality of care for diabetes and, and depending on where you live. And that's not acceptable. I can't complain because the peak, this, the peak where my local practice have actually been fantastic. They wanted me to change to Chesterfield to diabetes uh, care, but because I've been diabetic 50, 56 years, I've always had care from Sheffield and I insisted I stayed there. Not a problem. All they said was foot care, I couldn't have done in Sheffield anymore, and eye screening, I couldn't, but I haven't missed an appointment at all. They have kept on top of it. And blood testing, they're actually printed out my blood test results because they can't transfer them to my notes in Sheffield for me to bring to the hospital next Thursday. So I can't complain. It was well, just the advice not to go to Chesterfield for my diabetic care. Yeah, and there are some good doctors. So in fact, one of my research fellows, Dr. Shilo, um, he, he did PhD with me, is now the consultant at Chesterfield. So again, uh, he's now providing really excellent care in Chesterfield. Dr. McInerney also, and uh, Dr. Basu are also um, are providing good service. Things are improving. Um, it just needs, they just need more resources. And, yeah. and that's all, yeah. Uh, so uh, Hazel, what, what has worked for you for 54 years? Uh, when you have a winning, when you, have a winning <laughs> team, you don't change. It's like Sheffield United, you know, I support Sheffield United. I go with a season ticket holder. Um, we're doing very well at the moment. We're not going to change the team. <laughs> right. Thank you. Anyway. Can I just shout out to Hazel? Please yes. do. Are you in the medalist group on Facebook? I am in the medalist group, yes. Oh, yes. brilliant. Brilliant. Yes. Well, you, I hope you attend all our meetings then. I think I we should, to, but not we should get Solomon to come and talk to the medalists, I think. Yes, I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I'd be delighted to. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'll keep you to that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'd be delighted to. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's getting quite late now. It is. Really past my pyjama time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> No name for pyjamas at this time, I'd have bet. Um, so I want to thank everybody for coming and I want to thank uh, Solomon for giving a, a really good presentation and for answering all the questions that we've submitted. Uh, and hope you're feeling better soon, Dr Solomon, and that you, you'll be out of isolation soon. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, everybody, for the yep. kind invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. See you again. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you can never change somebody that comes from Yorkshire, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> I say me. that to my daughter. She's gone over to Manchester and she starts using phrasing a minute. Excuse me. <laughs> You're a Yorkshire girl at heart. Me too. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you soon. See you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.